Hello and welcome to the first video in our leadership mini lecture series. I'm Dr. James Blackmore Wright and I specialise in strategic leadership and the development of high performance teams. In this session, I'm going to discuss the importance of leadership and introduce you to leadership theory. So why is leadership just so important for us? Well, it's important because whether you are currently a leader or have aspirations to be a leader, your leadership skills can be the difference between delivering better results for your organisation or business failure. Put simply, effective leadership is an essential ingredient for successfully translating strategy into action and within a complex environment. High-performing leaders are required to display traits of vision, respect, innovation and also initiative. And most of us make the assumption that leaders are directors or politicians, though that assumption is often misplaced. The need for leadership can be found anywhere that change is required, where people need development and where an organisation is required to thrive rather than merely survive. There are different views about whether management and leadership are different or basically the same. And key thinkers like Cotter and Gabrielle argue that organisations need both management and leadership, but actually that they are different as well. Gabrielle summarises the key difference as follows. Now, leadership shapes the future, but it's actually management that delivers it. Whilst Cotter comments that the most organisations are actually overmanaged and probably underled. However, as Hartley, Bennington and Martin point out, there are also alternative views. For example, Yukol argues that most scholars seem to agree that success as a manager or an administrator in modern organisations necessarily involves leading. So managers are potentially leaders, but they are not the only ones. In particular, collective theories of leadership, such as systems leadership, do not limit leadership to formal positions of authority and stress that leaders can and do exist at every level in organisations and also in their communities. So leadership is a broad and complex subject, which is a wide range of scholarly definitions and an expansive body of literature. For some, it has doubtless become something that is elusive and something of a magic concept, an art instead of a science. Obscured the fact that most ideas and theories about leadership have been developed in contrasting timeframes and environments. And it's not easy to provide a straightforward answer to the question of what leadership is. Of course, we can think of people in positions of political power, such as presidents or political party leaders as administrative leaders occupying top positions in government or non-profit organisations. We can think of high-profile business leaders who guide international corporate entities, yet what leadership exactly entails, who is responsible for it, and what it is and what's achieved is context-dependent and is always contested. As you will see from the following academic definitions that illustrate each of these perspectives on the scope and purpose of leadership, there are factors that complement one another, and yet there are areas of potential conflict as well. These three different perspectives emphasise the personal characteristics that leaders possess, how they are likely to think in complex situations, and the importance of stability and objectivity. There is the notion that leadership is a result of a process, or indeed contributes to a process that in turn affects a group or organisation. There's also the idea that leadership is part of something that is bigger, something that connects society at a number of levels. And whilst these definitions are insightful, you will no doubt see that one of the key challenges that exists when studying this field is that there are multiple definitions. There's an abundance of leadership definitions and a simple Google search will reveal many thousands more. And it would actually be folly to try and establish what the best one is. The most cited works often refer to the systems of leadership and the relationship and divide between managers and leaders. Leadership has been referred to as a skill, a practice, an art, a science, 
an action, an individual or a group and so on. For simplicity, to aid our understanding of how theory can be useful and to consider leadership as something that drives performance, I would like to frame it as the act of achieving positive and sustainable results through others. So that those who can organise people, organisations and the numerous resources available to us can be considered to be leaders. And because of those who are able to do this in the long term by developing a better understanding of how people think, act and behave can be considered to be effective leaders. And those who can do it with compassion, awareness and empathy can be considered to be great leaders. But to gain a deeper understanding of leadership, we must increase our understanding of human behaviour, of the dexterity that is required to navigate organisations, and of what happens physically, emotionally and psychologically at the intersection of performance, change and strategic management. And as you'll recognise, it is a discipline of considerable complexity and you will encounter a number of different and often conflicting and controversial theories along the way. Theory helps us to understand what has happened before, why it might be happening again, now and in the future, and how we can increase our understanding of that phenomena. As Stam states so well, it can be succinctly described as the systematic organisation of knowledge which can be applied for the purpose of problem solving. And leadership acuity will increase in line with our understanding of the discipline. So let's consider the significant milestones that have occurred in leadership theory. Now timelines can suggest that there will be a point in time where phenomena will become redundant and that we'll be progressing seamlessly into the next big thing. And you'll notice that the timeline model does not suggest that theories have become redundant and no longer relevant in the modern world. And even the classical notion of trait theories are currently being developed and may be of value depending on the context and leadership challenge to be analysed. For example, Sacero argued that trait theories have again become interested in leadership research as this research develops a greater conceptual, methodological and statistical sophistication for us. But we begin, however, a little bit earlier than trait theories by considering the long legacy of divine right theory, something that we still see prominent examples of in both nations and organisations today. Shulgi, a king of Neo-Sumerian empires, some 2000 BC, was one of the first to declare himself divine, and kings were often regarded as deities after their death. And the concept of divine rule can be traced across subsequent empires, from the pharaohs of Egypt across to the Romans. Upon his death, the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar was officially recognised as a god and temples were erected in his name and the worship of emperors became a unifying factor in the Roman world. It helped to focus loyalty, obedience and order within military units and administrative regions that were located far from Rome. Neville Figus's classical study the divine right of kings was to frame the notion of divinity as being an essential element of the defensive makeup of the monarchy. And let us remember that considerable political claims were being staked by the Catholic Church. A threat to the monarchy and therefore the sovereignty of the nation was viewed as an existential one and therefore divinity was tantamount to survival. Its origins, wrapped up in the political and religious turmoil of the 17th century England, may be far removed from the world today, yet we still see the impact of leaders who view themselves as divine. Yet if we fail to understand the dynamics of such situations, we increase our understanding by considering relevant theories, then we are at risk of making significant errors in judgement. Prior to the scientific community embarking on a structured assessment of management techniques, the great man theory of leadership was popularised during the 19th century. Famous leaders contributed to the mythology that leaders are born and not made, and their characteristics were often left unchallenged, a phenomenon that we would describe today as the halo effect. The halo effect is best understood as a level of cognitive bias in which our overall impression of someone will influence how we feel about them, whether we like, trust or admire them, or actually may want to follow them. And the halo effect in leadership is well known, 
but we may not be conscious of it all of the time. Great leaders appear great to us because of a small number of observations that we make of them. Attractive, well-dressed and elegant people, for example, will often be perceived as intelligent, decisive and assertive, qualities that many of us actually seek in their leaders. And this effect can have serious consequences for leaders and followers. Rationality and objective decisions can be overtaken by poorly informed judgments regarding future performance. Remember, the job interview is one of the most ineffective ways to assess future performance, yet is still the most common tool used in recruitment at all levels, and especially for senior level hires. It was the historian Thomas Carlyle who contributed much to the theory, stating that the history of the world is but the biography of great men, and a view that was endorsed by many due to its flawed logic and a paucity of challenges. An early research into leadership afforded only a narrow view and observation of people who had already had successful careers in leadership, and these people often included those who had achieved their position through inheritance, not too far removed from the divine right of kings, because people of a lesser social status had fewer opportunities to practice and achieve leadership roles, and it contributed to this idea that leadership is something of an inherent ability. And even today, people often describe prominent leaders as having the right qualities or personality. And this implies that inherent characteristics are what make these people effective leaders and leading to such a, a self-perpetuating cycle. The focus of trait theory is to find people who have what it takes to be a leader. And the belief is that leaders are born and not made and that personality and social, physical and intellectual traits or what differentiate leaders from non-leaders. And one significant challenge that researchers have and theorists who have written about the traits of successful leaders is the question about whether traits are immutable. Will the same traits be seen as producing effective leaders in different countries and cultures and across different races and genders? The early writers about trait theory were universally writing about white male leaders and it wasn't until Robert House and associated researchers undertook their GLOBE studies in the 1990s that attention was focused on whether leadership was culturally determined. In his famous model of organisational culture, Charles Handy distinguishes between four types of organisational culture. Power, the role culture, task culture and the person or support culture. Trait theories which emphasise specific leadership attributes and behaviours are tied to power culture, where power is held by just a few individuals. The call for charismatic leaders is typically loudest in situations of crises, emergencies or breakdowns. Role culture is more associated with routine tasks where staff have clearly defined responsibilities within a hierarchical structure. And this requires transactional leadership, which focuses on increasing the efficiency of established routines and procedures, and is more concerned with following existing rules than with making changes to the structure of the organisation. Highly political tasks may be associated with either a power culture with a strong leader or a task culture, which favours teamwork with experts where there is no single source of power. And this requires systems leadership so that leaders collaborate across organisational boundaries. Tasks which involve the development and dissemination of innovation need either a task or a person culture. The latter describes a culture where individuals happen to work for the same organisation but do not have a collective sense of being part of that organisation. There is a key challenge to the idea that there are a set of immutable leadership traits that all managers need if they are going to be successful. There is evidence that most of us expect different things from very senior managers than what is expected from near managers or our immediate supervisors. A seminal study by Shamir provided evidence of the differences in the way that distant leaders are perceived in contrast to perceptions of close or nearby leaders. Exploration of the implications of this distinction has been the focus of studies of the relationship between leader behaviour and leader subordinate distance. Most leadership research 
on the new transformational paradigm has been based on data collected by researchers interviewing chief executives and senior managers rather than data collected directly from those that they are responsible for managing. So in the main, these studies have focused on observations of top managers in organisations rather than middle and lower level managers. And this contrasts with earlier leadership research such as the Ohio State studies of the 1950s and 60s which focused on the styles of lower level managers and supervisors. And it's important to distinguish between these and distinguish between the models of leadership which have evolved from the data collected as a result of researchers interviewing top managers and top management teams and studies based on eliciting the perceptions of managers at all levels describing attributes of managers at the top level for example distant leadership and also distinguish between studies based on eliciting the perceptions of managers at all levels describing their immediate line manager supervisors so looking at the close or nearby leadership and the distinction between distance and close or nearby leadership is particularly important for us. The dynamics of the influencing process differ depending on how close or distant followers are from their leaders. In other words, the types of leadership behaviours that can affect followers and those behaviours are evaluated by followers depending on how close or distant followers are from their leaders. So briefly, we were going to define leadership distance as the effect of the leader-follower physical distance and perceived social distance and perceived interaction frequency. Thus leaders can appear to be very distant to followers if leaders are physically distant from them or maintain their status and power differentials by virtue of their elevated social positions or maintain infrequent contact with their followers. And this strand of thinking about leadership leads to a series of very important questions for us. Can both distant and close leaders influence their followers? Can followers identify and trust both types of leaders? And what causes distance between the two? Is distance beneficial or detrimental to leader outcomes? And can we explain the linkages of close and distant leadership to individual and group level outcomes. And Shamir's research suggests that we are more likely to expect distant leaders to be visionary and charismatic. But we do not tend to look for this in nearby leaders. Instead, we expect near leaders to exhibit traits such as an individualized level of concern, a concern for us as individuals as an expectation that near leaders will help us to become the best that we can be. And the research suggests that leader effectiveness is contingent on matching the degree of closeness that followers expect of the leader in various contexts. The focus of trait theory is to find people who have what it takes to be a leader. The belief is that leaders are born and not made and that personality and social, physical and intellectual traits are what differentiates leaders from non-leaders. Behavioural theories, on the other hand, shift our thinking from a focus on personality characteristics, which are usually viewed as innate or largely fixed, to an emphasis on behaviours, skills and abilities that can be learned and developed. And behavioural theory proposes that specific behaviours differentiate leaders from non-leaders and that these behaviours can be learned. The focus of the theory is to teach people the most appropriate behavioural responses for any given situation. For theorists, leader behaviour is best described as the main predictor of success. And behaviours are observable patterns of leader activities. All theorists typically describe between 11 and 30 behaviours, including the behaviours of short-term planning, clarifying task objectives, providing support, developing member skills and confidence, consulting and empowering members to take initiative in problem solving. Some of the behavioural theories of leadership describe leadership styles. A style is a moderate sized cluster of leadership behaviours often used to describe ideal leadership patterns. For example, Vroom and Yetten discuss a delegative 
leadership style in the context of decision making that emphasizes the behaviors of delegation and the management of innovation and creativity. Finally, skills are learned abilities and these are abilities that affect the quality of behaviors. Sometimes skills and behaviors are used interchangeably in the leadership theory literature. A universal approach to leadership assumes that at some level there is an ideal pattern of leadership behavior that fits nearly all situations. An early trait theory sought a universal approach but the latter leadership theorists adopted a contingency approach to leadership. A universal approach to leadership assumes that at some level there is an ideal pattern of leadership behavior that fits nearly all situations. An early trait theory sought a universal approach but the later leadership theorists adopted a contingency approach to leadership and they found from research that situations in which leaders found themselves in were crucial to determining their appropriate behavior and style. And the key questions that behavioral and leadership style researchers were trying to answer were, what do leaders do to be effective? What behaviors, styles and skills do they deploy? And what contingency factors affect which ideal leadership styles that in turn will increase the likelihood of leader and organizational effectiveness? Contingency factors are all the different types of variables that affect the style or behaviors of leaders as they seek to be effective. And different behavioral theorists considered different variables, but most consider intervening variables in which behavior styles should be selected moderating variables which affect the strength, quality or success of a particular behavioural style. For example, a common moderating variable is leadership expertise in a specific behaviour. A leader may choose the right style but may minimise its effectiveness because of poor execution. Three of the more common leadership characteristics considered in behavioural theories are skills, leadership behaviours and attributions of followers. Skills include inherent and early learned activities such as resilience and social skills. The analysis of leader skills and preferred behaviours helps to determine what leadership situations they should be placed in, what they will excel at and what biases they might have. Behaviour characteristics are more affected by education, training and experience than traits or skills and they include task, people or organisation orientated elements such as operational planning. And finally, leadership behaviours are influenced by the leader's estimation of followers, their competence, dedication and loyalty, and whether the leader thinks positively about their competence or negatively. The first research into these contingency frameworks was undertaken by researchers at the Ohio State University and the University of Michigan in the US, who developed these theories in the 1940s and 50s. They researched what leaders did and how they behaved, especially towards their followers, and they developed the Leader Behaviour Description Questionnaire, which revealed different patterns of behaviour, which they grouped together and labelled as leadership styles. And across the research groups at both universities, two important characteristics emerged that correlated with effective leadership, task orientation and people orientation. When it comes to the indifferent or the impoverished, these leaders have minimal concern for people and production and their priority is to fly under the radar while they content to seek solutions that won't bring any negative focus to themselves or to their department. Preserving their employment as well as their seniority is what drives their elusive and evading behaviours. In short, the indifferent leaders are ineffective and are sorely lacking in any of the traits that can be attributed to successful and effective leadership. If we think about the impact that they have on employees, employees have a high degree of dissatisfaction and there's no harmony within the group. There's also likely to be a high level of turnover. Their impact on the organization is also negative. There might be inefficient operational awareness. When it comes to the country club, or accommodating style. In this classification, these leaders will go above and beyond to ensure that the needs and desires of the employees are met. And these leaders are assuming that their staff will yield maximum results 
as they are likely to be self-motivated when they are led in such an environment. These leaders will have behaviours that will yield and comply with the needs of their staff. The productivity of the group, however, can suffer from the lack of attention that may happen on tasks. When it comes to impact on employees, generally they are happy and there's good levels of team harmony. But when it comes to the organisation, there can also be, paradoxically, a low level of productivity. When it comes to the dictatorial or produce, perish or control effect, these leaders focus all of their attention to production related matters and very little towards the needs of their employees. They will direct and dominate while holding the belief that efficiency gains can only be achieved through rigid disciplines, especially those that don't require human interaction. Employees are generally considered to be expendable resources and productivity is usually short-lived as high employee attrition is usually unavoidable. The dictatorial style is inspired in part by the McGregor X and Y theory. If we think about its impact on employees, employees will experience a high level of dissatisfaction and usually a high level of conflict within the different groups. As far as the organisation is concerned, we often see high levels of employee turnover and peak performance is short-lived. When it comes to the sound or team approach, according to Blake and Moulton, and I agree with this, the sound leader is the most effective leadership style. And these leaders will contribute and are committed and can motivate and are motivated while holding the belief that trust, respect, commitment and employee empowerment are essential for fostering a positive team environment, thus resulting in maximum employee satisfaction as also the most efficient level of productivity. This sound leadership style is also inspired by McGregor's theory. We think about the impacts on employees. Generally, uh, they form a highly cohesive team. Employees are satisfied and employees are motivated and work together well. When it comes to the organisation, there's often a low level of employee turnover and organisations attract highly skilled employees into a highly efficient organisation. Task and subordinate characteristics became the primary focus of leadership theories in the 1950s through to the 70s. And one early expression of this was McGregor's theory, based on the belief that some people's behaviours led them to be naturally good or naturally bad at leadership. And theory X and Y, developed by MIT professor Douglas McGregor, a theories of human motivation that provide a framework for how managers use behaviours and tools in the workplace to encourage productivity. The theories are concerned with how best to motivate them through providing the most relevant provisions, but they differ in what they believe are the most basic and powerful of human needs in the workplace. Theory X suggests that human beings are inherently lazy and dislike the concepts of work and are only in the workplace because they need money and managers who subscribe to this theory will typically see interactions with employees as transactional and feel the need to rely on strong financial incentives. Theory X managers may be predisposed to seeing humans failing and as being the cause of problems rather than systematic or structural causes. Theory Y, on the other hand, is underlined by a belief that work comes naturally to human beings and they can be both motivated and also exercise self-control. It's in essence a more positive view of human beings than Theory X. Under Theory Y, employees seek out responsibility and enjoy performing at a very high level. And organisations underpinned by Theory Y are more likely to have cultures of trust, transparency and engagement, as well as healthy two-way relationships between managers and their subordinates. McGregor shows how different styles used by managers can vary depending on which theory they subscribe to. When managers apply theory Y principles, workers receive interdependence and responsibility for work. They receive opportunities to recognise problems and to find solutions to them. And this results in high quality relationships. In contrast, theory X managers highlight the close supervision of workers and the chain of command and they seek to motivate subordinates using extrinsic rewards. 
Therefore, workers that are overseen by Theory X managers tend not to have the most beneficial relationships. They maintain a distance and have impersonal and low quality exchange relationships. So in summary, as leadership researchers began to recognize the limitations of the traits approach, they started to focus on the behaviors that leaders demonstrated, the skills they deployed, and the situations in which they were effective. Theorists began to move away from the notion of a universal set of leadership behaviors and started to study specific contingencies and how they impacted on the deployment of leadership behaviors and skills. The impetus for research on leadership skills rather than behaviors was a classic article by Katz in the Harvard Business Review in 1955 titled Skills of Effective Administrator based on his empirical research and observations. He suggested that there were three basic administrative skills, technical, human and conceptual. And he argued that these skills are quite different from the traits or qualities of leaders. Skills are what leaders can accomplish, whereas traits are who leaders are. He defined leadership as the ability to use one's knowledge and competencies to accomplish a set of goals or objectives. And Katz defined technical skills as knowledge about proficiency in a specialised area, analytical ability and the ability to use appropriate tools and techniques. He defined human skills as knowledge about their ability to work with people, which is quite different from technical skills, which has to do with working with things. And broadly speaking, conceptual skills, Katz defined as the ability to work with ideas and concepts, which is central to creating a vision and strategic planning for an organisation. So conceptual skills are fundamental for senior managers, but also important for middle managers whilst technical and human skills are most important at supervisory and middle management levels. Following on from Katz's lead in the early 1990s, a group of researchers funded by the US Army and the Department of Defense set out to test and develop a comprehensive theory of leadership. These researchers' main goal was to explain the underlying elements of effective performance and they wanted to identify the leadership factors that created exemplary job performance in an actual organisation. Based on the extensive findings from this research project, Mumford and colleagues formulated a skills-based model of leadership. The model was characterised as a capability model because it examined the relationship between the leader's knowledge and skills, so capabilities, and the leader's performance. The skills model frames leadership by describing five components of leadership performance. At the heart of the model are three competencies, problem solving skills, social judgment skills and knowledge. And these three competencies are the central determinants of effective problem solving and performance. Although individual attributes and career experiences and environmental influences all have impacts on leader competencies and of course performance. In summary, Katz's three skill approach suggests that the importance of certain leadership skills varies depending on where leaders are in a management hierarchy. In their later skills model, Mumford, Zaccaro, Harding provided a more complex picture of how skills relate to the manifestation of effective leadership. And their leadership skills model contends that leadership outcomes are the direct result of a leader's competencies. And this skills or competencies approach works by providing a map for how to reach effective leadership within an organisation. And this notion of developing leadership skills is unique and quite different from other perspectives. If leaders are shaped by their experiences, then they can develop their abilities through experience and training according to the skills-based model.